Hello everyone, uh, welcome to my talk about detecting noisy neighbors with eBPF. My name is Jose Fernandez. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Netflix. I'm on the compute team, which is within the cloud infrastructure organization. Um, I specialize in observability, performance, and compute efficiency. I'm also the creator of BPF Top, which I'll talk uh, later in this presentation. Um, outside of work, I enjoy spending time with my family. Um, I'm based in Colorado, so I love going to the Rocky Mountains. Um, I like playing pickleball and playing video games. So the compute and performance engineering teams at Netflix, we frequently investigate performance issues in our multi-tenant environment. Um, the first step is figuring out if the problem is happening uh, at the application layer or in the underlying infrastructure. Uh, one issue that often complicates this process is the noisy neighbor problem. So on Titus, our multi-tenant compute platform, uh, a noisy neighbor refers to a container or a system service that heavily utilizes the service resources, uh, ca causing performance degradation in adjacent containers. Uh, we usually focus on CPU utilization because it's a workload's uh, most frequent source of noisy neighbor issues. So this meme here illustrates uh, a common scenario that we face uh, with noisy neighbors. Um, so without any concrete data, uh, teams tend to blame each other when there's a performance issue. Uh, so the performance engineering team sometimes suspects it's a compute flat platform, maybe noisy neighbors. Uh, the compute team, my team, uh, maybe sometimes points at application code. We're not sure if it's uh, a problem in the in the app itself. And our developers, the users, um, sometimes tend to blame the infrastructure. So detecting the effects of noisy neighbors is complex. Uh, traditional performance analysis tools such as Perf uh, can introduce significant overhead, uh, maybe making the problem worse. Um, additionally, these tools are, are normally deployed after the fact, after there's a performance problem, which is too late for effective investigation. You gotta catch it in the act. Um, another challenge is that debugging noisy neighbor issues it requires significant low-level expertise and specialized tooling, which not everybody uh, in, our, in our team has. So given all that, um, here are some key requirements uh, for a solution that we wanted uh, to detect noisy neighbors. First, uh, we need a continuous real-time instrumentation. So this solution has to be running at all times, uh, ensuring that it, it is there uh, running when, when the issue happens. Um, then we also have, need to have minimal performance impact. So it's, it's critical that our instrumentation doesn't introduce um, noticeable overhead. Um, we also need deep kernel visibility. The solution has to be able to monitor a process at the, at the kernel level, uh, particular visibility into the Linux scheduler. Uh, we also need a solution that can handle Netflix scale workloads. And finally, uh, that should, the, this solution should be accessible for non-experts. So we want it to be intuitive enough so that even those that aren't kernel experts can use it and get uh, useful information from it. So now that we covered the requirements, let's talk about EBPF and why it was ideal for detecting noisy neighbors. So EBPF is a feature of the Linux uh, kernel that allows us to run sandbox programs in the kernel without modifying kernel code. So this enables us to capture uh, data at a deep level with minimal overhead, which is exactly what we need in our scenario. So first, uh, EPF allows us to develop uh, programmable monitoring solutions tailored to our needs. Um, EPF also our programs are executed within the kernel and they're highly optimized. Uh, so they introduce minimal overhead uh, while providing rich insights. Uh, EBPF provides access to low-level scheduling events and the actual kernel data structures. Also, EBPF scales efficiently across our multi-tenant environment, um, handling monitoring at the level of traffic and system complexity that we have that we require at Netflix. 
And finally, with eBPF, uh, we can emit metrics in a format that powers our, our dashboards, making the data accessible and understandable even for those who aren't kernel experts. So to ensure the reliability of our workloads that depend on low latency responses, we use the EPF to instrument the run queue latency for each container. Uh, the run queue uh, latency uh, measures the time processes spend in the scheduling queue before being dispatched to the CPU. So an extended waiting time in this queue can be a sign of performance issues, especially also when containers are not using their full CPU allocation. So we'll, we'll talk about the, the hooks, uh, the EVPF hooks that we use to instrument run queue latency. Um, the first set is get wake, wake up and get wake up new. So these hooks are invoked when a process uh, changes state from uh, sleeping to runnable. So they let us identify when a process is ready to run and is waiting for CPU time. And during this event, uh, we generate a timestamp to store it in an EPF hash map using the process ID as the key in this hash map. Conversely, uh, the sket switch hook is triggered when the CPU switches between processes. So this hook actually gives us pointers to the process currently on the CPU and the process that's about to take over. Uh, so we use the upcoming task process ID, PID, to fetch the timestamp from the EVPF map. Uh, and this timestamp time represents when the process entered the queue, which we had previously stored in, in the previous slide. And we then calculate the run queue latency by simply subtracting these timestamps. So one of the advantages of EVPF is its ability to provide pointers to the actual kernel data structures that represent uh, processes also not as tasks in kernel term terminology. So this feature um, enables uh, access to a wealth of information stored about a process. Um, and for our use case, we needed the process C group ID so we could later associate it with a container. Um, but however, this C group information in the process struct is safeguarded by an RCU lock or a read copy update lock. So to safely access this RCU protected information, we can leverage kfunks in eBPF. Uh, kfunks are kernel functions that can be called from eBPF programs. And there are kfunks available to lock and unlock RCU uh, read, critical, read side critical sections. So these functions ensure that our eBPF program remains safe and efficient while also retrieving the C group ID information that we needed. So once the data is ready, uh, we need to package it and send it to user space. So for this purpose, we chose the eBPF ring buffer. So it's, it's very efficient, high performing, uh, user friendly. Uh, it can handle variable length data records uh, and allows reading data without extra memory copying or, or syscalls. So the, this, the ring buffer is hands out my favorite eBPF data structure. I, I, I like using it a lot of bunch. However, uh, the sheer number of data points was costing the user space program to just use too much CPU. So uh, we implemented a rate limiter in eBPF to, to do some data sampling. And here's the, the example code for that. So um, here's the diagram again that I showed earlier just to, so that you can connect all the, the parts of this uh, solution. Um, in our user space application, which uh, we developed in Go, um, it, it's processing events from this ring buffer to emit metrics to our metrics backend Atlas. So each event in that ring buffer includes the run queue latency sample with the C group ID, uh, which we can then associate it with containers running on the host. So we categorize the metric uh, as a system service if no such association is found. So, but when a C group ID is associated with a container, we then emit uh, a percentile timer uh, as an Atlas metric, and we call that run queue latency. Uh, we also increment a counter metric, uh, which there in the, in the diagram is called the uh, sket switch out to monitor preemptions occurring for the container processes. 
So because we can access uh, the previous cgroup ID of the preemptive process, it, it lets us tag this metric with the cost of the preemption. Uh, whether it was a process within the same container or the C group, a, a process in another container, noisy neighbor, or a system service, also a noisy neighbor. So it's, it's important to highlight that both the run queue latency metric and the sketch switch out metrics are needed to determine if a container is affected by noisy neighbors, which is the goal that we're trying to achieve. Um, so relying solely on run queue latency can lead to misconceptions. For example, if a container is at or over its C group CPU limit, the Linux shell will throttle it, so it'll slow it down. And there, that will result in a spike in its run queue latency. Um, and if we were only to see that metric or look at that metric, we might incorrectly attribute it to a performance aggression because of noisy neighbors. And it's actually because the container is just getting throttled because it's at its uh, CPU quota limit. However, uh, if there's spikes in both metrics, especially when uh, the cause of preemptions is a different container or a system process, that clearly indicates that there's a noisy neighbor problem. So um, this is uh, the run queue latency metric for uh, a server running just a single container and has ample CPU capacity. And this is charting the 99th percentile of the run queue latency. As you can see, uh, that 99th percentile averages 83.4 microseconds. So this is our baseline. And although there's some spikes, you know, it goes up to 400 microseconds, the latency I think remains within acceptable parameters. So at, at 10.35, um, launching a second container, you can see that in the diagram in the chart, um, the second container was set up to fully utilize all CPUs on the host. And as you can see, uh, the run queue latency for container one, uh, which is the, the, the blue, um, it spikes, it has a significant spike, 131 milliseconds spike. So that's 131,000 microseconds. Um, and this spike would be noticeable in the user space applications in the process uh, if it were serving, let's say, like HTTP traffic. Um, so if, if the app owners for container one came to us and like, hey, around 1035, we saw a spike in latency and we can't explain why, then we'll be like, oh, it is because there was a noisy neighbor problem. Another container came online and it caused that latency spike. And now if we look at the sketch switch out metric, uh, the green, it indicates that the spike was due to increased preemptions by system processes. Uh, so these are system uh, services that power the, the container runtime. So it's highlighting that the noisy neighbor issue was system processes competing with containers for CPU time. So th the system processes were actually the noisy neighbors, but it's likely that it, that was triggered by the container two consuming all available CPU capacity. So we developed an open source eBPF process monitoring tool called BPF Top uh, to measure the overhead of uh, the code, the eBPF code in this uh, hot kernel path. And our profiling indicates that, you know, we're adding less than nine, 600 nanoseconds per uh, hook. Um, you, can, you can just Google BPF Top and you, you'll find it. Also, uh, during our research on how the kernel calculates these EUPF statistics, we identified an opportunity to improve the calculation. Um, so we submitted a patch, which was included in the Linux kernel 6.10 release. And there's uh, that tiny URL is a link to that patch if you're interested. So through trial and error and using BPF top, we identified several optimizations to help maintain that low overhead of our eBPF code. So we found that the, the hash map was the most performant for storing in queue timestamps. Uh, we tried using the task storage uh, map type, but that resulted in nearly a twofold performance decline. Um, there's also the per CPU hash, uh, hash map, but it was slightly less performant than the regular hash uh, map which was unexpected uh, if you're familiar with that data structure. So that's, I think that requires further investigation. 
Uh, we also experimented with the LRU uh, hash uh, map, uh, but it it added about 50, 40 to 50 nanoseconds uh, uh, per invocation. Uh, we originally used this because we had some concern about PID churn because we're storing uh, process IDs in this map. Um, but ultimately, we just settled on the, on the hash, the regular hash map, and we just increased the size to mitigate this risk. Um, also, the BPF core read helper, it adds about 20 to 30 nanoseconds per invocation. Um, we were originally using them because we, we thought we needed to use them. Uh, but um, in the case of raw trace phones, so those uh, BPF folks that start with TP underscore B BTF, it is safe and more efficient to access the task struct members directly. Um, lastly, the the sket switch, sket wake up, and sket wake up new uh, hooks, they're all triggered for kernel tasks. Uh, and you can identify them because their PID is going to be zero. And we found that monitoring these tasks were necessary. We're not trying to detect noisy neighbors uh, due to the kernel. So we just implement in several early exit conditions um, to prevent costly operations like accessing uh, BPF max. Notably, the kernel tasks also operate through the scheduler queue, just like any other regular process. So our findings highlight uh, the value of low overhead continuous instrumentation of the Linux scheduler. Um, so we have integrated these metrics into customer, our customer's dashboards. It's enabling actionable insights and it's really guiding our multi-tenancy performance discussions. Um, so whenever there's uh, another performance problem, we use these metrics to um, identify whether it's a noisy neighbor or not. We can also use these metrics to refine our CPU isolation strategies uh, to minimize the impact of noisy neighbors. And additionally, thanks to you know, all this work, we've really gained deeper insights into how the Linux scheduler works. Um, this work has also deepened our understanding of eBBF technology. Um, and it really underscored the importance of tools like BPF Top for, for monitoring and optimizing eBBF code. Uh, we think that as eBPF adoption increases, there's going to be more infrastructure observability moving to eBPF and also business logic moving to it. Um, so one promising project that I'm pretty excited about is SCEDEXT, which it really has the potential to change how uh, scheduling decisions are made and you can start tailoring them to specific workload needs. So thank you for coming to my talk. Um, there is a blog version of this talk that has all the ABPF code, so you can you know, copy it and, and, and use it. Um, there's the tiny URL. And here are all my social links. Um, thank you.